For the next 100 Minecraft days, I'll be living an engineer's dream by attempting to progress through the hardcore Create Above and Beyond mod pack. With a detailed questline to guide me, which by the way I made sure to read thoroughly beforehand, and a deep desire to acquire a high-tech potato cannon to kill the Ender Dragon, my adventure began. After collecting a few logs to kick things off, I spotted an interesting house on the other side of the river. It must have belonged to an old mining villager because there was a rail track inside leading very far down into the ground. I struggled a little bit with some broken stone beneath my feet, but eventually made my way down, and what I found at the end of the tunnel is likely the reason there wasn't anyone still living there. The villager had found some goodies before their untimely demise though, so I gladly acquired them for safekeeping. While I was down in the caves and had some food now from the chests, I figured that I may as well mine a few ores before closing out the day. Most of day 2 was spent reading the quest book in a little bit more detail to see what fancy machines I'd need to put together first. Pretty much everything that I came across required a lot of kelp, so I decided to set off and look for an ocean. I quickly realized though that I had no food, so I whipped out my professional Minecraft skills to acquire some cooked meat. But little did I know, I was competing against the chicken with a thousand IQ, so this took a little bit of time. Once I reached an ocean, I collected about four stacks of kelp and traveled back home. The first machine I decided to create was the mechanical press, which can stamp regular ingots into metal plates. But to make this do anything useful, I first needed to set up a power source. One of the easiest early game ways to do this is with water wheels. And to maximize the power output of the wheel, I tried to surround as many sides as possible with flowing water. Although the resulting structure wasn't conventionally beautiful, at least the efficiency was. As I was making these initial contraptions, I started to notice that wood was a hot commodity in the world of Create. So I set myself a goal to build an automatic tree farm. For this, the next machine on the agenda I would need would be a mechanical saw to cut down the trees. This required lead, however, so I popped back down into the mines to collect some. I then crafted up the saw and tested it out using some rubber belts to transfer power. Tree farm complete! Eh, just kidding. Go big or go home, right? Using a magma block I had found earlier, I crafted up a few more items that could utilize the heat it generates to create a rotating contraption. But while constructing it, I realized I was missing a key ingredient. This was slime. In Create, to make sure that blocks stick to each other when moving, you have to use slime. But slime balls are kind of hard to come by in the early game. I did a little bit of research and decided to go exploring for a slime island, but I hadn't seen one so far, so I really didn't have my hopes that high. But literally within 30 seconds, I ran into some slime blocks laying on the ground. That genuinely made my day. After some celebration, I ran back home and finished up the farm. For anyone unfamiliar with this contraption, essentially the deployers on the back place down saplings and the saw on the front chops down the tree when it grows. When the contraption makes a full circle, it deposits any items it was holding into the storage chest. Since I only had enough materials at the moment for a single saw and deployer, I realized that I could actually increase the farm's efficiency by moving them to the edge of the contraption. Also, uh, one incredible feature I haven't yet mentioned about this pack is that when mining ores, I get a single crushed ore, which when smelted turns into three nuggets. So each ingot literally costs me three ores. And with the rate at which I was getting through my ores, I really needed a better way to process them. My solution to this problem required two components, a millstone and a tinker's construct smeltery. So for the next two days, I worked on setting everything up. Unfortunately, Create decided to fiddle with the recipes a bit, so the smeltery was a little bit more expensive than usual. But by golly, it was worth it, because now, each crushed ore gets milled into three ore dust, which the smeltery then converts into a single ingot. Yay, we are now equivalent with vanilla Minecraft. With my new smeltery setup, I combined a bronze handle with a copper binding and an iron tool head to make my first Tinker's pickaxe. By this point, I was starting to really struggle with food though. Even though I lived by a river, I found out that the fish that spawned there couldn't actually be smelted into cooked fish, so I would need to do some proper research to figure out a good food source. After perusing through the plethora of gourmet food recipes, I decided to live off bread for the remainder of the video. Now, I've cut most of it out, but every other day or so I've had to run back into the mine simply to collect andesite. Crate uses a lot of andesite in its recipes, and since the whole point of this pack is automation, I decided it would be worth making a farm for it. The easiest method for doing this early game is to create a cobblestone generator over bedrock. The mod authors changed the game so that instead of cobble, you end up getting stones like andesite and granite. 
Over the next few days, I collected the necessary resources which required a lot of mining. I did find my first diamonds down there though. And then once I had everything I needed, I dug a 3x3 tunnel down to bedrock for the andesite to be transported up to the surface. In hindsight, I probably only needed it to be 2x1, so I wasted a lot of time. But once I finally reached the bottom, I dug out an area for the andesite generation contraption to go and constructed it, along with a rope pulley at the surface, which would be used to oscillate a chest back and forth. After a friendly reminder to prioritize my sleep schedule from everyone's favorite mob, I put the finishing touches on my machine. This included a timer for the piston to push away the andesite, and a pretty high gear ratio to make the drill run faster. For the next several days, my primary goal shifted to automating the production of kinetic mechanisms. These are a core component of all of the basic crate machines, and are a pain to craft manually. There were quite a few steps I needed to do in order to accomplish this, so I wasted no time. One of these steps was to automate the production of kelp. I had never built one of these farms before though, so I fiddled around quite a bit to try and figure out a design. I ended up making it very similar to the tree farm from earlier by utilizing the mechanical bearings and a rotary chassis. As a reward for my display of engineering geniusness, I was greeted by a drowned holding a trident and walking on land, and it almost killed me. My next course of action towards these kinetic mechanisms was using a strainer to generate sand and then washing that sand to make clay. Then when trying to use a mixer to combine the clay with the kelp, I overstressed my power system. It was finally time to add in a massive new upgrade, another water wheel. Once the clay and kelp were mixed together, the resulting algal blend was smelted into ingots by an encased fan blowing hot air through lava. The last step was setting up three deployers to poke some wooden slabs with andesoid alloys in order to make the kinetic mechanisms. This is way faster than what I had to do before and way cheaper too, but it still wasn't fully 100% automatic. That is a task I am leaving to later in the video. But even though I now had a system to easily craft these kinetic mechanisms, I was still far from being able to make many of the really cool things in the create mod, like robot arms, speed controllers, mechanical crafters, and obviously, most importantly, the potato cannon. So in order to acquire these complex machines, the next massive goal, which would take many, many days to complete, was to automate the production of precision mechanisms. This is essentially like the level two of the kinetic mechanisms. By the end of day 21, I had a small contract to make brass ingots, and also collected some sky stone from a nearby meteor. I wasn't quite sure why I needed it yet, but the quest book told me to get it, so I was a good Minecraft player and did what I was told. By this point, I was starting to get very low on some essential materials, like iron, copper, zinc, etc., so I decided to go on a mining trip. After a few minutes, I stumbled across a massive cave. However beautiful it looked though, it was very dangerous. But thinking back to all my years of Minecraft experience and the recent hardcore challenges that I had completed, I plucked up some courage, stepped into the abyss, and then ran around like a headless chicken to light the place up. I ended up running so much that I even got an achievement for jumping 16,000 times. It's kind of ironic that I earned that from the comfort of my desk chair, but hey, I'll take what I can get. After mining for two full days and barely making a dent in the number of ores in this cave, my pickaxe finally broke, signaling that I should probably return home and get back to work. The next day I set up a few more water wheels and built a system converting the sky stone from earlier into a weird liquid that was supposedly useful for something later on. Another supposedly important part along the path to making these precision mechanisms was to grow some applied energistic certus quartz seeds. Finally, this was something I was used to from other packs, so I didn't bother to take the time and read the instructions in the quest book. Spoiler, I definitely should have read the instructions. I knew that growing these seeds by throwing them into water would take some time, so I decided to go on a small adventure to look for some copper ore. While exploring around the nearby caves, I came across another large one. So naturally, I tried to recreate my run like a headless chicken strategy, only this time my dodging skills were a little less impressive. Shortly after, I came across the perfect biome. It had exposed stone on the mountains, so I was able to find tons of copper ores that were easily visible. After cupping myself some copper, or as I like to call it, copper cupping, I made my way home. But on the way, I was attacked by a baby drowned on land, and later on by some phantoms. But by complete chance, I stumbled across a random tent with a bed in it. Literally, I could not have had better timing. While the Surtis Quartz seeds were still growing, I wanted to keep progressing and decided to make a charger so I could convert plain Surtis Quartz into charged Surtis Quartz. This needed a Flux Crystal though, which requires Nether Quartz, so I built a portal and hopped through. The Nether did freak me out a little bit though, so I collected what I needed and then headed back home. 
With all the required materials, I crafted up a charger and now had the ability to charge Certus Quartz. This would also be needed later on for making the precision mechanisms. As for the status of my wonderful Certus Quartz seeds, they were still growing, uh, slowly. Uh, they had grown about 11% in three days. And if I've done my math correctly, that would mean that these seeds wouldn't be grown until about day 55. So I decided to take another look at the recipes to see if there is any faster way to accomplish this growth. And it turns out you can actually grow them almost instantly by squirting them with water. In case you're unfamiliar with the spout from the create mod, I took the time to build it incorrectly just to show you what not to do. Yeah, uh, you're welcome. Uh, the correct way to do it is to move the seeds underneath the spout on a belt. It's a bit more complicated than that though because the seeds only grow by 1 12th each time it's squirted. So at this point I had three options to fully automate the growth stages. First would be to set up a long line of 12 spouts which is quite expensive given how much rubber and copper they use. The second option would be to cycle the seeds around in a circle underneath the same spout 12 times. Or the third option which I may or may not have chosen chosen, deal with it later. I knew that having an automated supply of rubber would make life a lot easier, especially when needing to make these spouts later on. So I looked through the recipes until I discovered a method of making rubber using an arboreal extractor to suck it out of a tree. Once I saw that the extractors were working properly, I hooked up some pipes and sent the liquid into a basin with a mechanical press on top. I then rooted the resulting rubber into a chest. Okay, there's been a lot of engineering technical work so far, so if you've stuck with me this far, either you find this interesting like I do, or you've actually left the room but forgotten to pause the video. Either way, I think it's time I started some building and took a break. Specifically, I'd like to make a massive factory to house all of the contraptions I've made so far, with spare room for future ones. After experimenting with block pallets for a few days, I settled on a combo I liked, put on some music, and got started. With the exterior of the base now complete, I installed shafts and gearboxes all the way around the floor. Then I took all of my water wheels and moved them into their new home. Even though water is basically free, I set up the power system so I only needed one line of water to flow and spin both sets of wheels. For the next few days I cleaned up what remained of my previous power plant outside and installed belt systems to transport all of the kelp and tree farm loot into the factory. When I attempted to do the same thing for my andesite generator, I realized that I had never actually finished fully automating the collection system. The rope pulley still had to be activated manually with a lever. It took me quite a few days to figure out a good way to do this, and it got a bit complicated, so I'll spare you the details, but in simple terms I had a comparator that could detect when the chest had emptied out. The chest would then get sent all the way down to where a hopper at the bottom would start filling up the chest, and then once the hopper was empty, a signal would be wirelessly sent back up to the rope pulley telling it to bring the chest back up. Before I could properly test the system though, I had to fix my storage situation because it was a little bit of a mess. For now, I decided to just keep the items unsorted and dump them into a line of double chests. Now that the items actually had a place to go, I checked my pulley flippy floppy system and good news, it worked. With all of the items now being transported into the factory, it was time to start doing something with them by setting up a fully automated system for manufacturing kinetic mechanisms. As I mentioned before, the one outside wasn't 100% automated. Since I couldn't yet sort the items, my plan was to temporarily have a few input chests that I would need to fill up with the raw materials. These items would then get sucked into the system, automatically processed and fabricated until out popped the kinetic mechanisms. The first step for this was to automatically wash sand into clay and combine it with kelp to form algal blend. The sand ended up needing to be sent through three fans at a super slow belt speed for them to fully process before reaching the basin. I then rooted the resulting algal clay all the way around the back and set up three fans facing the opposite direction. These fans are for blowing hot air over the algal blend to smelt it into algal bricks, preferably not for turning me into a flaming pile of ash. At this point, I was having issues with ensuring that the right amount of clay and kelp were being inserted into the basin, so I improved it by sending the kelp from a different side as the clay and putting a recipe filter on the basin for algal blend. 
Next, these algal bricks were combined with andesite cobblestone in another basin with a mixer to produce andesite alloy. Why oh why did I choose this version of Crate to make a video on? Normally, andesite alloy is literally crafted from two iron nuggets and two andesite. As you may remember from my terrible setup earlier in the video, I was crafting kinetic mechanisms by using deployers to poke wooden slabs while holding andesite alloys. The exact same process will be used here, I just needed to start the automation of the wooden planks. To do this, I place down a line of three saws. First, the logs get converted into strip logs, then they become wooden planks, and finally, random furniture. It turned out that the last saw needed a filter in it. The very final step was to transport the andesite alloys up and into the deployers. And there you have it, we now have 100% automated kinetic mechanisms. It's been about 60 days now, and I've officially completed one of five chapters in the quest book, which doesn't seem like a lot. The good thing though is that to get my potato cannon, I only need to complete chapter two and automate precision mechanisms. I do already have some of the infrastructure in place that I've been working towards, like the Certus Quartz charger and the Skystone processing area, but I still needed to bring it all into my factory, add a few more things onto it, and connect it all together. So I thought a bit about the layout I wanted and got started. The first contraption I built was a cobblestone generator that pushed the cobble into a mill to make gravel. Then I washed that gravel into iron nuggets and flint, and any excess gravel was sent to an overflow chest. The iron nuggets would be the ones that were needed later on in the manufacturing process. On day 63, I revisited the task of growing certus quartz seeds, and used the rubber from my rubber farm to craft up 11 more spouts. I then set them up in a long line and filled them up with water using a pump. While the seeds were growing, I returned to the iron nuggets and fed them into a melter from Tinkers to turn them into molten iron. But as I was doing so, I overstressed the water wheels. There are other methods for power generation which I haven't explored yet, so I figured it was time to see what else was available. I ended up deciding to go with a windmill since I thought it would look really cool on the outside of the factory, but this required a lot of wool, so as night fell on day 65 I set off to find some sheep. Quite quickly I came across a village, I thought their lamp posts may have been built with wool, but it turns out that these were different designs so I continued on my way. At about midday on day 66 I found my first group of sheep in a swampy forest biome. I couldn't remember remember exactly how much I needed, so I just spent the rest of the full day finding sheep and shearing them. The next morning, back at the factory, I set up the windmill on the outside of one of my walls. But as I was admiring my work, I realized it definitely was not looking as cool as I was hoping it would, but at this point my priority was efficiency, so I kept building until all of my wool was used up. I then connected the windmill to my power system and watched it turn. Now that I had the power I needed to keep working, I built a contraption that milled one skystone block into one skystone dust and one skystone block. That breaks all of the laws of physics, but hey, that's basically the definition of Minecraft, right? This dust was then rooted into the basin where it would be converted into that liquid I talked about earlier. It's actually called Sky Solution, so I should probably start referring to it as that. To produce this Sky Solution, I also had to provide the basin with water, so I connected up the same pump that was supplying water to the spouts. But when trying to pump the Sky Solution out of the basin, the regular pump I was using was getting confused and tried to remove all of the liquid, including the water. That's where the smart fluid pipe comes in. With this item, I can place in a filter to tell it exactly what to extract. Next, I moved the Certus Quartz charger from outside inside the factory to supply the Sky Solution basin and produce destabilized redstone. The mixer for this only seemed to use the charge from the Certus Quartz, so I extracted the resulting normal Certus Quartz and threw it back over the top to land back inside the charger. I won't lie, this is getting a little bit crazy and I could feel my FPS dropping, but it's just so satisfying to watch everything working away properly. This next part is the most exciting though, it is the part where all of these seemingly random items are going to come together and make the precision mechanisms. During the night of day 70, I mixed the destabilized redstone with the fully grown Certus Quartz crystals to produce polished rose quartz. Then the next day, I squirted the polished rose quartz with the molten iron to make electron tubes and finally supplied a line of three more deployers with electron tubes and a screwdriver to upgrade the kinetic mechanisms to precision mechanisms. After this, I was so happy. Now I can finally make all of those amazingly cool brass level machines. The first ones I wanted to make were mechanical crafters, and after hooking them up to my power system, I crafted my first set of crushing wheels. The reason I really wanted these wheels was to make my source of sand faster and more renewable. The strainer I was using earlier was very slow, and with crushing wheels, I could crush cobble from a cobblestone generator into gravel and then again into sand. 
but the second I hooked these big wheels up to my power system, I overstressed it again. The easiest upgrade I could think of now was to just add more sails to the windmill. So off again I went to find some sheep for wool. But instead of sheep, I actually got kind of lucky and found one of those tents which was entirely made of wool. Now with a much larger windmill, I went back inside and set up a cobblestone generator above my first set of crushing wheels, and transported the resulting gravel temporarily into a chest. I then placed down a second set of crushing wheels that accepted the gravel and then turned it into sand which was sent right into my kinetic mechanism factory. After this I decided to revisit my storage area and properly sort out the items into storage drawers. This would make it much easier to find the materials I wanted and would also make it quite easy for me to dump the excess materials that were being produced way too fast to prevent them from clogging up the system. For my next main goal, which was the potato cannon, I would need another precision mechanism and at this point I had automated pretty much every raw material needed for this except certus quartz. Not realizing that this could be super easily duplicated by growing a seed into a pure crystal and then mechanically crafting the crystal into two seeds, I popped down into the caves searching for as much as I could find. I then crafted them into seeds, set them growing, collected the precision mechanism, and crafted the potato cannon. Eager to test it out, I loaded up an apple and shot it. Oh yeah, it doesn't need to be just potatoes by the way, you can actually shoot any type of food you like and each type of food actually does a different amount of damage, so naturally I wanted to find the most deadliest food I could shoot someone with. And it turns out that is blaze cake, created by squirting lava onto a blaze cake base. But to make this blaze cake base, I would need a lot of eggs, sugar, and cinder flour. Not knowing how many cakes I would need to defeat the ender dragon, I decided it would be smart to make farms for each of these ingredients. The first one I created was a sugarcane farm. Again, similar to the kelp and wood farms, I made the use of a rotary chassis to harvest the second layer of the sugarcane as it grows. For the eggs, however, I needed to find some chicken, or actually any bird for that matter. Swans apparently lay their own type of eggs, so I brought them over to my base instead, using seeds and trapped them in a hole. I then put a chute and a chest underneath them to catch all of the eggs and bred the swans together. The final ingredient, cinder flour, was actually super easy to make so I didn't bother to automate it. For this I just needed to pop into the nether, grab a bunch of nether rack, and then chuck it in my crushing wheels. The sugarcane and eggs would take some time to generate though, so I tried to decide what I should spend my time doing while I'm waiting. And at that point I remembered I was still kitted out in plain iron armor, which is not the smartest idea for fighting the ender dragon and traversing the outer end islands afterwards. So I decided to craft up some obsidian armor. Surprisingly, it required a lot of obsidian. Who would thought, so I ran to a nearby broken nether portal and collected some. While the obsidian was being processed, I found out that there was also an obsidian upgrade I could make to my shield, but for this I would need an obsidian skull, which requires a skeleton skull. Normally this would be super difficult to acquire, but thankfully there is a tool in Tinker's Construct called the Cleaver, which is basically a heavy, massive sword that increases the chances of a skull dropping from a mob. So I crafted one up using the smeltery and went down into the mines looking for skeletons. With this skull, I crafted up everything I needed and equipped the shield. Oh yeah, did I forget to mention? It also prevents me from fire damage for up to 30 seconds. This would be very, very helpful, especially because I still haven't collected any of the ender pearls or blaze rods from the nether that I would need for finding the stronghold. Feeling confident now with my full set of armor and a shield, I ventured into the nether to acquire these items. For the ender pearls, I found a nearby biome where they seemed to spawn quite frequently. Then I set up a little roof over my head and taunted them to come and fight me. Sometimes though, they were a little too far away, so I had to run outside of the space to lure them in. That was a little bit dangerous though. Once I had collected plenty of ender pearls, I set off in search of a nether fortress. One mistake I had made though, which I hadn't yet considered, was the fact that I only had 14 bread. This may sound like a lot, but trust me, it doesn't go very far when you still have to find a fortress, collect blaze rods, and make it all the way back home safely. I collected a little bit of meat along the way, but had no method of cooking it. Nearing the end of day 85, I came across another fortress, but it couldn't have been harder to get to. It looked like I would need to bridge over the lava to reach it while there were blazes all over just waiting to knock me off. But after analyzing my options, I realized that I could make the jump if I dug down a little bit. As for getting back, well, that's a later problem. After about 10 minutes of running around the fortress, I found a blaze spawner and collected the rods I needed. This was way less stressful than it could have been knowing that I had 30 seconds of fire resistance. Now my solution for getting back out of the fortress was an ender pearl, which was definitely a safe thing to do. 
With only two bread remaining and two pieces of raw meat, I started running back to the portal. Thankfully, I had used some wood to scaffold with along the way so it wasn't too hard to find my way back, and by the time I made it to the portal, I had only just ran out of food. That was a slightly stressful experience, but I'm glad I made it home safely. On day 87, I created a small factory for the blaze cake production. It started with a mechanical press to combine all of the raw ingredients into the cake base, and finished with a spout to squirt the lava icing on top. Blaze cakes, yeah! I did a few rough calculations based on the health of the dragon and the damage of the cakes, and decided that I would need at least a stack of cakes to be safe. As for taking down the end crystals, the damage didn't need to be much, so I decided to use apples for that instead. While the eggs and sugarcane were continuing to multiply, I completed a few more tasks that I had been meaning to do for a while, but had never gotten around to it. The first was to turn my wheat farm, that I had been tending to manually this whole time, into an automatic farm. It is a little sad that I hadn't bothered doing this yet, but hey. Better late than never, right? After that, I made a small storage area in my factory for my items, and installed a weighted ejector plate as a fun but slightly painful way of getting up there. Once my items that had previously been spread out all around in random chests were sorted, I started another task I had been wanting to do so badly ever since I finished building the factory. An automatic door. Monsters had previously just been walking in on me, so installing a proper door would be both practical and look really, really cool. I won't go into the details because I messed around quite a lot with the design, but by day 94, I got it working. When I step on the pressure plate, the doors open for about 5 seconds and then close again behind me. By this point, over a stack of blaze cakes were finally ready, and the next morning I set off in search of the stronghold. It did take me about 15 minutes to find, but eventually I stumbled across it, and what I saw freaked me out a little bit. The stronghold had spawned in the middle of one of the large caves, so it was very exposed and there were a lot of monsters who wanted to kill me, but I knew I had to do it anyway, so I used a water bucket to help lower myself down and ran inside. Now we all know that the portal room can be hard to find, sometimes you find it right away, other times it may take 5 minutes or so, but this time I was genuinely going mad trying to find it. I could have sworn that after at least 20 minutes of running around, I had visited every room in the entire stronghold with no luck. At this point I was slightly concerned that the cave may have glitched out and overridden the portal, until finally I decided to just start randomly digging into walls and sure enough, I found it. It turns out that the weird cave generation had messed it up a bit by completely disconnecting two areas of the stronghold. Either way, I had now found it and still had plenty of time to take on the ender dragon and explore the outer end islands. Once I was through the portal, I bridged over to the main island and started taking down the crystals. One of the really bad things about the potato cannon is its range is terrible, so instead of being able to take the crystals down from the ground like you could do with a bow, I had to bridge all the way around the top of the island shooting the crystals from up high, in hopes that the dragon didn't come and knock me off. It was quite a slow and stressful few minutes, but I eventually took out the last crystal and water bucketed down. Not an MLG water bucket, let's be clear here, it's day 97, but this kind of water bucket. For the remainder of the fight, I swapped over from the apples to the cakes. The problem was though that the range was so terrible, I had to wait for the dragon to land since I couldn't reach it when it was flying up high. After a few minutes of hitting it from underneath, I finally killed it. After a small celebration, I hopped through the little portal and made my way through to the outer end islands in search of an end city with an elytra. Nothing too spectacular happened, but I did take a selfie with a cute baby enderman wearing a backpack. On day 97, I found an interesting looking biome with some tall, pretty trees, but there wasn't much there so I kept on moving. I found my first end city on day 98 and collected some of the diamond armor and tools that were in the chests, but unfortunately this one didn't have a ship. Or did it? As I was leaving, I noticed what looked to be a shipwreck close by. Hoping that it would have an elytra, I dug through the endstone to find a chest, and sure enough, there was an elytra. Also this time I remembered to bring some rockets along with me, so I was able to immediately equip it and fly away. On my search for a portal to head back home, I found an end slime island, collected some slime from it, and continued flying. Once I made it back to the central island, I collected the dragon egg and portaled home. Another piece of loot I had found on my travels was an ender staff, which uses ender pearls in the player's inventory to let you teleport around. Naturally, I had to try it out. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah, well, that was almost 25 hours of footage down the drain. Thankfully, I had some food to heal up with, but yeah, I am for sure not using that staff ever again. 
Once I was fully recovered, I took a fly around the factory to see it from up high, and honestly, I was quite happy with the progress I had made over the past 98 days. The challenge now was almost over, but I still had two full days to do something with, preferably something safe. As I was searching through the different items from Create I could make, I came across Nixie tubes, which could display numbers and text in a cool little glass structure. But unfortunately to display text, they needed a name tag, so instead my goal was to just have them say the number 100 to represent 100 days. The number they show is based off a redstone signal, so I used a chest and a comparator to give the first Nixie tube a signal of 1. But it's not day 100 yet, so I turned off the signal for now. As day 99 came to a close, I fixed a few holes in my factory roof and taught myself how to use another cool create machine, Mechanical Arms. On day 100, I made it my goal to make the most useful factory out of everything I had made so far. Of all the incredible things that Mechanical Arms could be used for, I made them fight over which table the apple should be on. As night fell, I set my Nixie tubes to display 100 and went to sleep. And with that, it is now day 101. I successfully survived 100 days in hardcore create above and beyond. Thank you all so much for watching. My previous two videos were focused heavily on exploration and boss fights, so it was a nice change to switch gears and play with a highly technical mod for this video. If you made it to the end, as always, here is a secret word so you can let me know that you watched the whole thing. Blaze cake. Or, well, that's two words, but whatever, it still works. I'll see you all in the next one.